now it's going. Oh, now it's going and I'm good. I'm good to go. Oh, there. I'm good to go. Hello, everyone. I am Deborah Pascali Bonaro, and today is extra special in so many ways. If you're joining us live, it's Holy Week, and we're holding everyone in our heart and prayers for peace, health, and well being, especially in this time in the world. We're also celebrating my new book, The Ultimate Guide to Sex After Baby, Secrets to Love and Intimacy. Wahoo, with all your support, is trending at number one right now on Amazon new releases. And to make it even better, I have such a special guest that I have been waiting for today for. She's a really dear friend. Her wisdom truly rocks my world and changed my life. This is Gail Teller. She is a midwife who develops spinning babies, a body-based approach to more comfortable pregnancy and easier birth. Gail is some 30 years postpartum now, and I love that, <laughs> Gail, because we are postpartum the rest of our lives after we give birth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she lives with her husband who just passed by there um, in Minnesota and is applying the same principles post-menopause. Gail is a mother, a grandmother, and brings the physiologic birth knowledge forward for parents and professionals at spinningbabies.com. And she's here today to talk with us about the secret of body balancing to intimate sex after birth. So welcome, Gail. Thank you, Deborah. It's amazing to be with you. And it's amazing that you did this, this book and what perfect timing for everybody. Yeah, it's really been special because as you know, I shared, I mean, at first when we planned the release, we wouldn't, couldn't have ever imagined where the world would be today. And I had this pause of, Oh, should I still be going ahead? And then I said, but yes, because even though we're in social isolation, we need more connection, love and intimacy and better yeah. sex now more than ever. So I so appreciate you being here because your tips, I mean, many people know I'm also a doula trainer and Gail, that's how we met years ago. Mm -hmm. and I tell that's for everyone, sure sign up for a spinning babies workshop somewhere in the world. That's like my number one they have to do after becoming a doula. And the other thing is to join your newsletter, which is weekly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of so yeah. much amazing wisdom. Like you're incredible. <laughs> changing <Thank you>. the world. <laughs> and now we're saying changing birth on a changing earth you know, because we're, we're really having to rethink how we get our material out there, aren't we? Yeah, yeah you're, you're doing such a beautiful job. And I'm so glad to be here to support you. Well, thank you. And I'm excited because I know all week long, people were really asking a lot, especially for everyone that's pregnant right now, right? And preparing yeah. and thinking about how do yeah. they prepare in these ways so your wisdom is essential at any time but certainly now understanding how people can access that body balancing and prepare for birth so that a gentler yeah. birth will prepare them for an easier and more pleasurable postpartum so tell us what is body balancing why is that even important to someone that doesn't know Body balancing means not too tight, not too loose, and not too twisty. So if we think about, you know, the typical way to think about our body is sort of we have a skeleton with muscles and skin over it. And we have organs that stay in place because all the pictures show them in one place, right? We, we know our stomach, we know our uterus, we, you know, we know where our organs are, but they're held all together with connective tissues and the uterus especially has uh, membranes of connective tissue around it with ligaments radiating off the cervical area like a hub of a bike. Think of a hub of a bicycle wheel with 
spokes going out in every direction and the outer wheel is our pelvis, right? So you have these lines going from the cervix out to the pelvis. They're lines of membrane. There's little muscle cells embedded in those ligaments so that they can go, the, the connective tissue forms in thicker areas that become the ligaments. It's the same material essentially, right? But it gets a new name because it's identifiable. It looks sort of like a little cable coming off, but there's little muscle cells in there. Muscle cells we know can lengthen when we do yoga, they lengthen and become supple. Long supple muscle cells and muscles give us more function and therefore more comfort. If they get contracted and tight, they're shorter and spasmy and that's where the pain can come in. So, if we think of the hub of the bicycle wheel with the spokes going out to the wheel, some of those ligaments can get short on one side or they can get a twist, just like if there's a sudden stop in gravity and then there's things can get twisted inside. So we seek balance. And in this case, it doesn't mean the balance of a busy life. It <laughs> means not too tight, not too loose and not too twisty. If you can imagine, you know, a little rope to some of, some of your body that's pulling tight, it could be irritating, it could be actually painful. And sometimes it's tight and no pain at all until something confronts it. So let's think about childbirth. We're, we're talking about postpartum time. So most of our listeners will have experienced childbirth. The baby comes through a series of muscle layers. If they're too tight, the baby, the uterine contraction moves the baby into that muscle and the muscle, instead of being supple and long and moving out of the way, then becomes an obstacle for the baby. It's not just about the bones, it's about the muscles. The ligament can get pulled over and then the baby's like, I'm going sideways. I'm not going straight through the birth canal, you know, through that bony pelvis. Uh, I'm heading over to this hip or I'm heading into the pubic bone or the back, you know? So when we're in body balance, the uterus is lined up with the pelvis, the muscles are, have some long supple mo motion to them, the movement of the muscle. So birth becomes smoother. There's, it's more comfortable. It could be challenging, but this is why I like our work together the Venn diagram of Deborah Pascali Bonaro and Gail Tully, the Venn circles of orgasmic birth and spinning babies. Uh, because I'm sure that there are many motivated and worthy, you know, like preparation that we do is equal, but some people have a painful long birth and some people have an easy birth. Why? I think it has to do partially with body balancing. Yes, there's emotional elements, there's mind and matter. There are um, stresses that people are facing that cause us to kind of tighten the jaw and then tighten the pelvic floor. Because as above, so below, you know, as we are tight in our throat, then our pelvic floor can tense up. But we live in gravity and we have sudden falls in gravity, or we have, how do we align our bodies in gravity? So over time, our muscles tend to have their habits based on our behaviors, right? It's not to say anything's right or wrong. We live in a civilization and a society that encourages certain movement habits. Sitting, for instance, sitting in a chair for 12 years of school. Hello, we are now conditioned, right? So we're, at Spinning Babies, we're offering a, an avenue into learning about body balancing. And right now I'm super interested in self-care. What can people do themselves? Yes. So postpartum, let's talk about postpartum. Let's talk about sex after baby. Yes. Um, we have a lot of really a high number of people that are having discomfort and nobody's really addressing it. There isn't enough conversation 
to find the clues to the pathway of resolving this. And people can go for years and decades with pain and not know that it can actually be resolved and sometimes in a very short time. You know, and it kind of breaks my heart about that. Um, oh, I see Jennifer Walker has, has stuck a Facebook uh, link in there for us to, ah. people, for people that are wondering what is spinning baby and what are you doing to babies? You know, first of all, babies rotate through the pelvis to get born. So if we can help that fetal rotation be easier, we can help birth be easier. And that's what the spinning means. Babies are rotating through the pelvis. The, and they're coming in contact with a bunch of muscles all the way through from above the pelvis, all the way through the middle of the pelvis and then over the skin. And because we can see the perineum, the, the skin between the vagina and the anus, because that's visible and we can conceive of it, then we think, oh, okay, when I have this baby, I don't want to tear, I don't want to be cut. Well, that's good because your body can, you can add body balancing and then the muscles in the perineum under that skin can, can stretch more easily. Okay, but hey, our listeners have been through this already. So if there was uh, pain in the postpartum and now it's affecting relationship because it's really hard to be intimate if it hurts. For sure, right? And that's right. what we hear from so many people, right? And some people just assume that that's a normal part of postpartum, right? And so what I'm hearing from you is it doesn't have to be. Right. And let's think about the timing of this too. So there's the birthday of the baby. Right. And now for the next several days, there's a big learning curve. You know, the, the womb has just released the baby in the placenta. So the area where the placenta was snug up on the inside of the womb is open and our psyche is really open. So this is not really a time to be receiving our partner's sexual energy. This is a time of being super open. The first few days after birth, we're, we're recovering. And that can be a couple of weeks, that can be six weeks, that could be a couple of months. Everybody's a little bit different. But that's also the physical body. Emotionally, we're, re we're readjusting to who am I now? And how am I caring for this baby? And here's my partner. And as you mentioned in your book, sometimes partners are like, hey, what happened to me? I, you know, if I go back to my postpartum, so I have two babies, Deborah. I had one at 17 years old and I had one at 30. So those very different experiences in my life, but both births had to do with being sort of outside the norm. So my postpartum time was pretty uh, had pretty limited support, although I had beautiful support for the support I had was beautiful, but limited in the way of, you know, especially as a teen mom, you're not, you're not accepted into society in, back in the day when I had mine, but even now. So, and there was a big silence about it. You, you knew to take a sits bath, but nobody I didn't know how to take a sits bath. What was a sits bath? <laughs> right. No one there to prepare it for you, right? And your child yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, you know, and so there was a, a bit of a recovery and adjustment to parenting. But as a enthusiastic new mother, even though I was young, I, I the enthusiasm was beyond what I didn't know. The, the enthusiasm made up for the lack of knowledge Right, and I, I, I did pretty well. And we figured it out. And by a couple of months, breastfeeding was easy. And, you know, we were on our way. But it took a long time. With my second one, I had a much easier birth. I literally caught him, Deborah, before he hit the floor. You know, I mean, I had- you caught yourself. Yeah. 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 
I had planned to have the baby at home with my partner and I, Vic, my partner. Right. And uh, I had started to go to births with other midwives. So one of my lovely midwife friends, Sylvia, was going to be my midwife. And then I asked, would you come after the birth? Because I really want to be in my zone and give birth. But I know, I know me and I need postpartum care. I have low blood pressure. I, I was a little bit of a seer. I could see that I was going to have a fainting issue. <laughs> so I wanted a midwife there. Well, you know, I did. I, I, I did have a little faint because I got into hot water, literally. I went and sat in a hot tub and it was too hot for me. And with my low blood pressure, I, I fainted. I went to this beautiful land of Snow White and the Seven Doors and they were having the party. If you remember your childhood musical party, the, they were playing their instruments and tapping their feet and I was clapping my hands and I was having a time of my life in in Technicolor, whatever, the cartoon. I was in the cartoon. And then I heard a rap, rap, rap at the window and I looked over the Seven Doors little kitchen sink that they had the hand pump and they had a little wooden window and there was my midwife's face saying gail gail so there was her real human face in the cartoon window saying gail gail and i just went oh no sylvia and i went back to the party i wow. didn't want to go and then i heard my husband's voice he's now my husband and he said gail and i said to everybody i gotta go and i woke up <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was a great place. I hope I go back there at the other side of my it was fantastic. <laughs> but how amazing, right? That the vividness of you knowing that you had left to this other space and that you knew to have your midwife arrive right at that time, right? To Yeah, yeah. I, I knew I wanted care. And you know, it's really nice to have care. <laughs> We, we try to do so much on our own. And I just knew in the balance of that time in my life, I, I felt very confident about giving the birth, but then I wanted postpartum care. I wanted to be cared for. Okay, so what does that have to do with our talk about? This is just what a fun is, little story to share. Yeah, it's a wonderful story to share because now you have me curious, what did she do for you? And what were the tips that helped you postpartum? And we can kind oh. of say what can people use of that today, especially because today they might not be having people come postpartum, right? Yeah. Even midwives sometimes are doing more virtual care than in-person care postpartum. Yeah. Having to do phone. Yeah. Midwives are in some areas are doing phone postpartum. Talking about vital. How do you feel? It's so important to get that rest, get off the feet and yet get up and, and empty the bladder because contractions are gonna be more painful when the bladder is full. Getting enough fluid and enough protein because your body is building up the repairing, you know, the new capillaries for repairing and that might be tiny, but it takes a lot of protein. Yeah. Building milk, you know, takes it takes protein. So we need some whatever kind of vegetables people can get. Hopefully they've got greens. There, a lot of the grocery stores have turnip greens. That's a very good green. Yeah, I love them. Yes, me too. And people aren't buying them. And it's like, that is, oops, that's the gold. That is the gold that's at the frozen vegetable department. Um, yeah, so rest, fluids, having a pitcher of water next to the bed, having some nuts. Um, boiled eggs, cheese, you know, what can you have for protein? See what you have and make the best out of it. Um, what self-care yeah. can they do, especially if their body is kind of feeling, you know, could they be out of balance postpartum from birth or? First phase is we're talking about the days of recovery right after birth. One of the uh, most common complaints is that tailbone that hurts the baby came past the tailbone the tailbone cr 
cranked open and it's not used to that position. So now the ligaments that have been held, holding that coccyx, that tailbone to the sacrum, they're ouchy. And sometimes the tailbone doesn't go into place. So if you had a, a hard ball about the size of an orange, or you could use an orange, I suppose, but maybe put a plastic underneath it. Um, laying on the floor or the bed with, you know, some kind of a roundish ball that's not too hard, but not too soft. Uh, and get that under the table. So you're laying on your back with your knees bent and very gently have a ball under the sacrum tailbone. And then you could just sort of move yourself and roll that ball on the tailbone, give a little counter, but do it super slowly. Let's go really slow, micro movement to get that ball just into the right spot. And that is um, a common complaint. Now, if you happen to have somebody in the house with you that can touch you, then uh, let's say on the outside, you so from the back, someone can give a little counter pressure on that tailbone and just slowly try a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left. You see, I'm not moving my hand much. We're not trying to shove it back into place. And if we do a little rocking or a little jiggle, See, that's not a big jiggle, but we start a vibration in there. It may be higher in the, in the sacrum. If the, if the tailbone's ouchy, try higher in the sacrum. Try over on the buttocks next to the, and just get that jiggle going for about 10 minutes. And the ligaments that support that coccyx are going to give a sigh. And they know their innate correct place to be but they can't get there because they've gone through this kind of, there was a stiffness there in this person. There was a pre-existing stiffness. The baby came by and now it, the tailbone's having a hard time getting back to where it belongs. So we set up the vibration so that the innate wisdom within the body can put itself back into balance. That's a simple way. Now, if the person doesn't have a, somebody to jiggle them, well, we can just start jiggling our own self, you know? Let's see. Just start jiggling your own self. Get your thigh going. And it, it will take longer. It will take longer. But we can lay on our side and start that jiggle. And it will radiate up to the sits bones. And in time, and we can shake your own booty. And it will get on over to the tailbone. And it'll take a little while, but do it on the right side, do it on the left side. This is, if this vibration, now let's match it to breathing. Well, we're not matching, we're not trying to breathe as fast as we vibrate, of course. But one of the issues about pelvic floor pain, now when I wasn't talking about pelvic floor pain, I'm gonna move into talking about pelvic floor pain. Because is that sp spasm, right? And what can we do for self-care? The tension above creates tension below. So if we can have relaxation above in our jawline and our throat, we can add to relaxation below. Imagine as we exhale, we're relaxing our pelvic floor so much that we're worried we're gonna urinate right here in our chairs listening to this podcast, right? <laughs> if you're... <laughs> If you're relaxing that much, you're relaxing to your pelvic floor too. And so go pee and then try it. Uh, come back and try. So relaxing the pelvic floor like a sigh, a sigh into the pelvic floor. Let's imagine our buttocks just spreading in our chairs. Imagine your vulva just sort of lowering down. Some of us who had, didn't pee before we got here, fortunately I did, because I knew I'd be talking, can feel like, oh, I better not relax too much. Now in the days after birth, you expect to have a little bit of urinary confusion, you know, pee frequently, reduce the pain of contractions by peeing frequently, drink a lot, don't try to reduce drinking so you don't have to get up and pee. What about that pelvis? 
Now let's move on. We talked about the pelvic floor relaxing that. Let's move on to the bony pelvis. Bony pelvis is a little bit unstable after birth because we still have the birthing hormones, but we, uh, and we've just gone through birth. So we don't wanna be doing too much activity with our pelvis for a few days. Getting up and going to the bathroom, a little bit of walk on the same floor of the house, that's, that's fine and it's good. But doing stairs, mm. as a midwife, I'm like, don't, no stairs the first week. I don't even want you on the stairs the second week. Let's get, if the toilet and the bedroom are on different floors, let's go get a, a, the potty chair from an older child, you know, or a bucket or something to pee in so that we're reducing the amount of times up and down the stairs. If somebody has to go on the stairs, then go down once a day and come up to bed once a day, but don't go up and down the stairs for two weeks. Don't twist when, when you're turning to twist, don't like throw one leg in one direction, you know, but keep little steps and make your turn. Um, Such important you, advice. Yeah, there's just simple things, you know, how do we get down to pick something up? We, we squat down, pick it up, hold it close to us. Um, try not to, to uh, use your back to lean over and pick it up. No house cleaning for two weeks. Forget it. You know, not not the majority, but there are some people who want the house to look good in case the midwife or the public health nurse or you know the relatives come by. So they want everything. Uh uh, they should be coming and helping. <laughs> Let whoever comes over tidy up. You you stay chill with the baby skin to skin. And that baby skin to skin is going to bring the parasympathetics into relaxation. That's going to help comfort your whole body. So let's talk a little bit more about pelvic stability. If, it's, if your pelvis is feeling really wonky, they have a special belt. I, I don't usually talk about companies, but there, I can remember the Sorola belt. Yeah. And you put it around the bones. This is not a belly binder. This is around the bones and, and it Velcro's snug. Now, some of you might have a belt, a really like a, a leather belt or a cloth belt that you could put around and make around your hip bones uh, and your upper sacrum or your or really lower back and hold your pelvis snug, not so tight that it's digging in your skin. Put it right on your skin so that when you go to the bathroom, you're not having to take it off. And just make it snug to hold your bones. You could use a long cloth and snug it. Snug one around your bones, a thin piece of long cloth, and another piece of cloth around your belly like a belly band if you didn't have a pregnancy belt. And wear those for a while. Wear those for a while. Um, I think it's great to wear them all the time but <laughs> when you get more stability in your back you won't need this the belt for your it's called an si belt sacroiliac belt to to keep the sacroiliac from wiggling around um no tummy crunches when you're getting in and out of bed and if you've had any tear or a physiotomy for the birth, no dragging your buns across to get to the edge of the bed. You know, whoops, there goes my phone. So it, you know how you drag yourself over to stand up. That's gonna pull on the, pel on the perineum. So we have to get up and make little moves, get up and make little moves, no dragging of the buns. Um, is this, is this the kind of thing we're looking yeah. for? This is awesome because yeah. we have to heal postpartum before we can move to the next layer, right? Like when we're looking at intimacy, there's so many steps first, right? Healing from birth on every level and then honoring postpartum. You're giving so many amazing tips because I find so many people are just thinking they're going to get going. You know, they're going to... Yeah. 
yeah. get back to something. And I always say, we're not getting back. We're only moving forward because <laughs> we're always changing. And this is a new body that we have yeah. to get acquainted. And I love that you're saying, and we have to get it balanced. And that's a piece that a lot of people miss in birth and now miss postpartum. So really good. And can I ask you to go further? Because what I yeah. get asked so often in being a midwife too is, you know, when will they be ready for oh. our intimacy? When, well, you know, intimacy is so many different levels. And so one is, I would say, what we can be ready for before we're physically ready for intercourse or anything inside the vagina, fingers, whatever that's your business <laughs> uh, I'm all of a sudden feeling very Minnesotan <laughs> but before we're ready for physical bodily intimacy let's have a little intimacy in the relationship we want we often want our partners to understand what we've gone through but let's not forget understanding what our partners have gone through intimacy is based on risk taking and sharing, and then being found that it was safe to take a risk and to share. So we wanna take a little emotional risk with our partners and we could do it in two ways. One, you know, honey, here's what I've just gone through. Please be with me. Give the, give, give the partner an action, they are very, you know, we want to be human beings, but our partners are often human doings. And so invite them into the being and have a day or two after the birth to not be doing, you know, to just be being and breathing, absorbing what's just happened. Now we're going on a learning curve. The partner wants, often wants to provide. The person who just gave birth often just wants to be. So understanding that the partner has a different role right now. They're hormonally and psychologically motivated to make sure that there's uh, provisions. So they might want to work. And the person who just gave birth was like, hey, we got this little newborn here. You're wanting to be on the computer and working or away at work if that's the case. Um, but they're having this drive to make sure that, that their family is provided for. And they also, both adults want to remember their competencies. And now with a little baby, the learning curve is super high. They're adjusting in ways that nobody can comprehend until it's happening to them. You know, when, when they're friends say, well, you won't sleep again. They're like, that's what people say. I mean, but now they're living it. Um, then it depends on the birth. Was this a birth that helped the person who just gave birth feel more of themselves, feel empowered? You know, or did it, did it surprise them and strip them of, hey, this, this was unexpected. I don't know who I am in this. This was, was it devastatingly disappointing, they're going to have a long road back to wanting to be physically intimate, possibly, unless their physical intimacy was where they felt confident. But our sexuality and our birth experience are, are a part of a continuum. And so we, we need to bring the pieces with us and bring the pieces together. I remember after my, my first baby, I didn't have a partner. You know, so I wasn't, this wasn't on my mind, but with my second one, I did. And I remember at about somewhere around day five, you know, okay. So day one, I was just like, there's no time goes by. It's just like a, absorbing this baby. Day two is like, Hey, let's make sure this baby's getting fed and peeing enough. Right. Day three is like that, all the hormones shifting tears and laughter and then tears again. And you know, oh my gosh, and just be compassionate with yourself to get through day three. Day four, it's like, okay, I'm getting a little bit understanding how this is going. Um, I can get a drink of water and a snack next to my bed. This is the big, you know, I can function a little bit. 
day five, I was like hormonally, I just, I just caught this baby myself. I feel like the earth mother. I wanted to make love to my partner so much. I just wanted to like, I am she, you know, I, I, it was, but physically I knew I, I couldn't go there. And I really almost, if I really thought about it physically, I didn't really want to go there. I could feel my body was way too open. Um, it would, but emotionally and psychically, I wanted to incorporate him and bring him in and, and just be that, you know, that earth mother with him. By day six, I was exhausted and teary again. <laughs> so amazing right the emotions ups and downs and so now you have me wondering so when was the right time well then my partner decided okay you know between the two of us this was the sixth child he decided he was ready for vasectomy I'm like why don't you do the vasectomy in pregnancy no don't do it in postpartum and you know I've been a midwife in with couples who've decided that that's the time for vasectomy he he knows you can't have sex anyway so why don't you schedule the vasectomy after the birth because he'll know he won't feel like having sex then <laughs> it's not a good time wow I, mean, I see that backfire so um so you know it's sort of like I went through that earth mother phase where I wanted to just be like I don't know okay if earth mother is the the mother part of it it would be like this you know the matching sexual being that wanted to be at that level you know and um and then I had a baby breastfeeding all the time and this was a little one that didn't sleep much and wanted to nurse a lot you know and so um by the time physically I was healed I wasn't all that interested because I had a lot of skin, 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 skin. And, uh, you know, this was a lot of years ago, Deborah. I'm trying to remember when it was, but I think it was about, well, he had to wait after the vasectomy for a while before he could prove that, that he wasn't fertile. And I think it just all corresponded to be about a month out, somewhere about a month. Some people aren't ready at a month. No, not at all. But I think shorter than a month is really pushing it with the uterine healing and depends on the perineum, of course. Some people have been healed up by a month. And we, I just don't think it's very compassionate to have sex before you feel like it and before, and there's a lot of things you can do without anything in your vagina, that's for sure. And, you know, there's a transition period there. We, you can have physical intimacy and stay away from the actual vagina if there's healing and healing of episiotomy, especially because that's that's not a, a superficial thing. Um, after bleeding is a typical time. There's a time where there's a, a healing and a bleeding after birth, and you know it's not it's not necessarily a hundred percent. Um, an absolute, but it's it's sort of energetically a, a time. Yeah. And so that could be six weeks for some people and a month for others and less for some people. So there's a lot of things to take into account, aren't there? There's yeah. Then for the partner who is being a partner in all things, intimacy is easier. Right? We feel heard, we feel seen. But like I said before, let's remember to hear and see our partner so that um, that's reciprocal because when we're caring for a little one, we have the hormonal, whoever gave birth, I'm talking about myself, I guess. So I'm saying we, but um, we have that hormonal guidance that tells us where we're at, but our partner doesn't live that and feel that. And we've got to incorporate them into understanding and have some have some care in how we breathe. It doesn't mean that I have to put myself aside 100% and 
and do what they want to do. But we want it. They want to be heard and acknowledged and have this. This is a need. Intimacy is a need. Oh, it's as you know, I say in the book, you know, we wouldn't go a day without water. And why would we allow ourselves to go a day without love and connection and intimacy, right? It's, it's an essential nutrient to who we are. And we need that more than ever when we're bringing life into the world, when we have a new one to care for. So your tips have been just fantastic as always, Gail. It's like, such a treasure to have this intimate discussion with you because yeah. you know you went from the body balancing where we began which is you know so much so important but you went so much deeper in sharing your own intimate details and just the the emotions and your wisdom about listening and connecting and hearing and being heard and seen. Mm. So beautiful. you, you know, I'm really inspired by your new book. So of course I've been reading it as I'm, as uh, it's come out because it has your beautiful voice in it, Deborah. And um, you are such a, a voice of where pleasure and dignity and transformation meet. And, you know, it just, it brought me back, but it, your book is for anybody at any stage. It's not, you know, you talk about postpartum, but you're talking about the question that you just asked out loud is why wouldn't anybody want to you know, design their life around pleasure and around intimacy? And I think I can answer that question Go ahead. You know, be, because, you know, I came from a life of, as many of us have, be independent, don't need others, and don't, don't need others. Um, you know, there's a disconnect. And someone pointed out the moment of disconnect that happens in our culture. And I think one of the reasons I'm very interested in helping at birth is because I think it happens, there's a, it happens at any moment, but there's a big event that happens when most babies are born. And I'm very concerned about babies being born at this time and not being able to have skin to skin and being held by their parents. Especially they need the heartbeat, the breath and the pacing of the person who they were with in gestation there. Yeah, the skin yeah. to skin. But what do we do? We take that baby and we put the baby over there, sometimes in the room, but you know, long ago, it was down in the nursery. And then we do suctioning of the back of the baby's throat. And that plastic bulb syringe to try to get mucus or water out of the baby's mouth, which by the way, almost every baby can, can spit. But in this case, they put the bulb syringe down into the baby's mouth and hit the vagal nerve. And the vagal nerve goes from the face to the heart and, and it sets up social connection. We need the face, we need the smiles, we need the eyebrows to move, we need the higher pitch voice. This is all social connection. And we take our babies away from that abruptly when they're born. And then the person in their psyche has the choice. Should I identify with the baby that has, has needs, needs in this case that aren't being met? Or should I identify with the warrior, the person who needs no vulnerability, which is not a real person because we all have vulnerabilities and we need to have that vulnerability met. And so we start to go through life identifying as a person that doesn't need pleasure. And this goes with the Spartans and the, you know, back in the Greek time where they separated. And, and there was even a North American tribe that had the peaceful, like the peaceful spiritual people. And in the same tribe, the warriors. And at about 12 years old, the elders would decide this child is gonna go to which group. And, uh, you know, we have birth practices that are set up to separate us from our own pleasure, our own social connection with others and split up families that way. 
So we don't want to do that. And no midwife wants to do that. No nurse or doctor wants to do that. They want to give effective care. And so we have to transform what is effective care at the time of birth. And spinning babies is about adding balance so birth can be easy so that the baby can have the skin to skin contact be held. This can go on for weeks. We have an opportunity. I hope that families can translate this time of being at home, the stay home period, to be a beautiful baby moon. Enjoy the skin to skin, singing lullabies, talking with the baby and looking into their eyes as much as they can around their recovery time. Well said, Gal. And so much work to still be done to change our system, but you and all your trainers are doing so much to educate not only parents, but providers on how to use these techniques for a gentler, healthier, safer birth. And for everyone that's listening, um, if they don't know where to find you, can you share yeah. your social media handles and your website? How can they get your wisdom all the time? Well, come on over to spinningbabies.com. And if you are on Facebook, come on over to the Spinning Babies Facebook page. In fact, I'm going to be doing Facebook Live at in about an hour and 10 minutes there with Claire Eccleston, one of our approved trainers who's a midwife in New Zealand. So for even for listening to a beautiful New Zealand accent, come on over at four o'clock. <laughs> she's just so, she's one of your followers too. She's just so beautiful. And um, yeah, we have an Instagram and we have the stuff, the stuff. Our beautiful Jennifer Tremper takes care of all of our social media needs. So now I, my mind doesn't have to be so full of it. But awesome. um, you, you know Jennifer Walker, and she's one of our approved trainers, and she's helping me with the Facebook Live. So now I'm, you know, I'm following far behind in your wake. You've no. really led the way in, in, um, you know, moving forward in this internet world. Oh, it's fun, right? It's And it's so wonderful now to be able to connect in this way. And as I said, when I started, if you're not on Gail's email list on spinning, go to spinningbabies.com and join, I highly recommend it. You truly give so many nuggets. And I have to say, I love your online, your daily essentials for those that are pregnant that can stream that, your parent class that people can, you know, stream and download. Um, you just have so many resources that anyone, if you're pregnant or you know someone that's pregnant, um, really the great time to invite them over to spinningbabies.com. I just so appreciate you, Gail, and all that you do. And I hope for everybody that's with us too, jump over to orgasmicbirth.com as well. And I hope you'll get your copy of The Ultimate Guide to yes. Sex After Baby. Pop over to Amazon Kindle and then back to our website so that we can donate those $2 to people in need right now that are pregnant. And also to give you a whole lot of free bonuses that you'll enjoy. So I thank you, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Thank you for being here with us. And we hope to see you again soon.